All right, so I'm an alum from Alpha Rho. Um, I know pretty much everyone here. Um, and I'm getting my master's in clinical mental health counseling from Liberty University. Um, I'll graduate in December. Um, and I currently work in the mental health field doing intensive in-home therapy with kids. So let's see, I'll share my screen. And we're gonna be talking about mental well-being, um, suicide prevention and resources today. Let's see, okay. All right, so mental health prevention is really important because a lot of people know the signs and symptoms of a variety of physical illnesses, such as heart attacks or strokes, but they're not able to pinpoint exactly the physical effects of things like anxiety, depression, um, PTSD, or panic disorders. There are a lot, a lot of common mental health treatments like psychotherapy, medications, hospital and residential treatment, and lifestyle treatments and home remedies such as meditation and yoga. There are common mental illness symptoms, such as not eating enough or overeating, having insomnia or sleeping too much, feeling hopeless, helpless, or lost, smoking, drinking, or using illicit drugs more than ever before, hearing voices in your head, um, being unable to do the activities that you used to do, like day-to-day -day activities, chores, things you used to enjoy, having extreme mood swings, constantly fighting or arguing with friends and family, experiencing physical symptoms such as feeling numbness, feeling fatigue, experiencing unexplainable body aches or achiness. And mental health disorders are actually more common than people think. Um, schizophrenia, 1% of Americans each year experience schizophrenia and 15 million adults in the United States experience social anxiety disorder. And bipolar, 2.6% of Americans experience it every year. Persistent depressive disorder, 1.5% of American adults. Generalized anxiety disorder, 3% of Americans every year. And obsessive compulsive disorder, 2%. And post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, 3.5% of Americans every year experience that mental health disorder. And those numbers are skewed a little bit um, depending on um, who seeks treatment. So, um, and there are a lot of myths about mental health, including mental health problems don't affect me. Um, like I said, mental health issues are actually very common. In 2014, about one in five American adults experienced a mental health issue and one in 10 young people experienced a period of major depression. Um, another myth is people with mental health problems are violent and unpredictable. You can see a lot of that in the news. Um, when things like mass shootings happen, they blame it on um, a mental health disorder. Um, they suspect a mental health disorder, but most people with mental health problems are no more likely to be violent than anyone else. Um, most people with mental illness are not violent and only 3% to 5% of violent acts can be attributed to individuals living with a serious mental illness. Another myth is prevention doesn't work. Um, it is impossible to prevent mental illnesses. Um, that's not true. Uh, prevention of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders focuses on addressing known risk factors, such as exposure to trauma that can affect the chances that children, youth, and young adults will develop mental health problems. Um, some of the things to look for to lower mental illnesses include stronger economies, lower healthcare costs, increased lifespan, improved family life, improved quality of life, um, higher overall productivity, better educational outcomes, and lower crime rates. And the last myth is I can't do anything for a person with a mental health problem. Um, and that's also not true. Friends and loved ones can make a big difference. Only 44% of adults with diagnosable mental health problems and less than 20% of children and adolescents receive needed treatment. Um, some of that is stigma. Some of that is not having the resources available near them. Um, reaching out and letting the people that you love, that you're available to them is really helpful. Um, helping them access mental health services. Um, risk factors of suicide include alcohol and other substance use disorders, local clusters of suicide, um, lack of social support and sense of isolation. Um, this is important in the times of COVID because a lot of people feel isolated um, and things such as drug use and suicide are on the rise. Um, there's stigma associated with asking for help and with having a mental illness. 
There's cultural and religious beliefs, such as the belief that suicide is a noble resolution of a personal dilemma. There's exposure to others who have died by suicide in real life or via the media and the internet. Um, there's job or financial loss, loss of relationships, easy access to lethal means. Um, men are more successful actually um, with suicide by using more lethal means to suicide. Um, there's hopelessness, impulsive and aggressive tendencies, major physical illnesses, previous suicide attempts, and a family history of suicide for risk factors. And the warning signs of suicide are talking about wanting to die or to kill themselves, looking for a way to kill themselves, like searching online or buying a gun, um, acting anxious or agitated, behaving recklessly, sleeping too little or too much, withdrawing or isolating themselves, showing rage or talking about seeking revenge, extreme mood swings, um, talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain, talking about being a burden to others. And a lot of times they'll also start giving away um, valuable things as well. And lastly, some mental health resources are the Suicide Prevention Hotline, which is available 24-7 um, at 1-800-273-8255, um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, um, the National Helpline, and the Veterans Crisis Line. And you press one and you can text and chat online. Um, a lot of the resources are available online too. So, and that's it. Brooke, what is the best way? Um, like I know there, you mentioned these um, hotlines and things that people can call. But if you notice that a loved one is, you know, withdrawing or has some of these um, warning signs, mm -hmm. um, maybe you can describe like how you might be able to encourage them to get help or guide them to resources. Yeah, um, so I would definitely, um, you know, show them unconditional support, um, kind of not come from a non judgmental place. Um, and then you can kind of hint and show them some of the resources that are available to them. Um, like, you know, I noticed that you are withdrawing from people, you're not really enjoying the stuff you used to like, um, but in, just in case, like, you can call this um, suicide prevention hotline, um, and it's confidential, and it's available to you 24-7, and send them that just in case they choose to use it, so. Yep. Any other Any questions? Maybe, yeah. maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> what are, um, I know you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the risk factors and myths and, you know, how to, the warning signs. What are uh, some ways that people can raise awareness, um, you know, like um, advocate and raise awareness for other uh, mental health disorders or even suicide prevention? Yeah, definitely um, having those open conversations with your friends. Um, if you see those risk factors um, and letting them know that you're there for them is good. Um, there's a lot of different advocacy networks such as the Out of the Darkness Walk, um, different national things you can do. Um, you can, you know, write letters to your um, representatives on um, different mental health legislations. I know there's um, legislation right now for um, like a national wide um, licensing program for counselors and therapists, um, because right now it's just state by state. Um, so if you're licensed in one state, you can't practice in another. Um, and so, yeah, um, I definitely what think would be, what would be the benefit to advocating or to writing a representative about that nationwide licensure? Yeah, so an important thing is that like not a lot, every state has different um, guidelines on what they need a counselor to do. Um, there's different classes in each state that they're required to take, like um, substance abuse counseling, I know is um, required in Florida. Um, and right now, um, it and then there's not really any regulation um, to what counselors need 
to be able to practice. So definitely like writing and advocating for that um, legislation to go through the national, it'll be a lot easier for counselors to know what they have to do um, to be able to become licensed, so. Great, and for some reason, the direct message has just come to me. So a question came in that said, what are resources to finding a psychologist or a psychiatrist? So on the same topic about licensure, um, can you explain how someone can find help that way? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of different resources. A lot of people are doing um, teletherapy right now, which has been super helpful for me. Um, I go to therapy myself. I think everybody should go, um, regardless of like mental health. Um, and you can Google, um, honestly, like therapists near me. Um, and usually websites will pop up like different um, therapists near you and different offices. A lot of therapists have their own web pages and you can see what they specialize in. A lot of um, therapists, they specialize in like trauma therapy um, and eating disorders, um, different stuff like that. So it really is just about like finding the right fit. Um, not every therapist fits every person. Um, and it could be, it can be hard um, to have to open up to that many therapists, but it's all about finding the right fit. So, and there's a therapist out there for everybody. Yeah, I agree. It can be kind of hard to find the right fit of therapist. Um, do you have any recommendations for like when people are Googling and finding therapists near them, like what to look for on their website to know if they would be a better fit for them? Yeah, um, definitely look to see if they specialize in, um, you know, what you're looking for. Um, there are therapists that uh, focus on like LGBTQ plus issues and they have like specialized training in that and certifications. Um, so definitely look for specifically uh, what you're looking for in therapy. Um, like there's, you know, people that specialize in like marital issues, um, you know, job loss, stuff like that. And um, usually what the therapist is advertising, what they specialize in, that's really what they're passionate for. So I think that that'll be a better fit if you look for what they specialize in, so. Awesome, that's super helpful. Um, something else came through chat and it says, um, that I think this is great that um, a member has shared that you could just text the phrase yellow rose and that would be a signal that you need help that you could um reach out to help them like they were in distress i assume and um you could be there for them no matter what no questions asked no judgment so i think that's a great tip um i know you mentioned the out of the darkness walk are there other uh, mental health advocacy organizations that our members could support and serve that you um have experience with and would recommend um i would recommend looking into your local community services board um i used to work for the one near blacksburg um they usually do like a lot of um advocacy events i know they did a in the past before covid they did like a um teenage substance abuse prevention um, program. Um, you could go there, you know, kind of network um, with people and kind of bring, if you knew teens, um, bring them. Um, and usually they put on a lot of different events, um, really just any like mental health agency, um, I would say to try to get involved with, um, whether that's like volunteering. I know there's different crisis lines you can uh, volunteer for. Um, and that would also be good as well, so. Yeah, I think it's great that you pointed out the community resource center, just as a reminder that like all local communities have um, organizations that support um, people who are experiencing mental health issues. And so I think all of our chapters are probably located in a place where um, they could get involved. Okay, another question. As a future educator, what are some warning signs that you can see in children so that you know when to step in? So warning signs specific to children, I think. Yeah, um, so that's a good question. Um, I mostly work with children. Um, so definitely like isolating themselves, like whether it's like not talking to their friends, like isolating themselves at lunch, isolating themselves like on the playground. Um, Usually they'll come in tired, um, 
they're experiencing extra fatigue, even if they get enough sleep at night, um, they're not eating as much. Maybe you notice that. Um, and they just kind of, you can tell when like a kid, uh, kids are very expressive. So you can tell when they're, you know, not really feeling themselves, like feeling down. Um, and they definitely have a switch in personality. Um, hopefully they have, uh, you know, a good school counselor system there um, and you can refer them to that. Um, or that's like a conversation you could possibly have with their parents um, if you feel comfortable with that, um, that you notice this stuff um, and just noticing it and being able to, for the kid to know that you're there for them really helps. Um, that's one of the resiliency factors actually for kids that are experiencing um, adverse childhood experiences is, you know, external support systems like coaches or teachers stepping in um, that really has a, a change and an effect on their ability to cope with certain events that go on. So. Uh, there's another question asking um, if anyone, I guess anyone on the call, not just necessarily you, Brooke, but if anyone has thoughts on organizations that we could do virtual service projects with um, since the current um, environment prevents us from doing a lot. And I think this might be related to convention. So if there are any mental health organizations that you know about that are doing um, virtual projects. Oh. Megan. So we're actually doing a mental health service project for convention this year. Um, let me pull up my, we're doing it all together and it is a virtual thing that you can do like year round, but we're doing this specifically together. It's called, we're on here, More Love Letters. And it's an organization that, um, like you get nominated, like people who need it are nominated by a loved one, like a loved one, a family member. Um, and they give you like a little bit of a bio about that person. And for the entire month that that person's profile is up, they have like five or six people, they can um, get letters sent to them. So they get sent to the person that nominated them and those letters then get given to the person that was nominated. So I think it's a really great thing. That's what we're gonna do um, at convention this summer. So that way we can all do something together and we can have those letters sent to that specific person. Awesome. Another one that you can do virtually very easily because you can mail a letter and not have to worry about physically being. With and knowing that encouragement from like family and friends and other individuals is really important based on what Brooke shared. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's the point of more love letters. So it's very exciting. Do you have any other thoughts, Brooke, on organizations that you know of that are doing virtual opportunities right now? Yeah, um, so the crisis text line um, is something good that you can use to volunteer. I think it's like a quick, um, like one hour training to be able to do it. Um, and it's just an anonymous text line. You can do it anytime um, and it's available 24 seven. Um, and you just volunteer to be there um, for the people that text in. Um, and you basically like refer them to resources if they need it, like the suicide prevention line. Um, and you're just there to listen to them really, so. That's great. That's a great project for chapters um, with mental health if the training is only an hour and then you can volunteer. So that's a great tip. Um, I think that would be great for especially our active chapters. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Oh, wait. Um, okay, so we have a message that came in just pointing out that a lot of the language that is used is hurtful to people who experience thoughts of suicide. So, for example, like snowflake, triggered, selfish sin, weak. So, especially in the wake of a person having a public mental health crisis or someone that died from suicide, it's so important to choose kind language and be cognizant of mental health. I think that's a yeah. great point to make. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, anything else? Any other thoughts, questions for Brooke or comments on this topic? I'll give it a couple more seconds for people to type in anything, but Brooke, thank you so much for volunteering to be here today and to talk about 
um, you know, mental health awareness and prevention and resources. I think it's just super helpful to open the door to these conversations, especially with this being one of our permanent projects or our permanent project. And I know so many people um, in our organization are really passionate about this topic. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay. With that, I haven't gotten any more questions. So uh, we'll close it out and we'll post the video on our YouTube when it uploads to the cloud. So thanks so much. And thank you everyone for uh, taking a little bit of time out of your Saturday afternoon to be here. I appreciate it. Bye.